Hey, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to the season opener of Wine Down Wednesday with my lady of the week. Ladies, this is season four. I cannot believe it. <laughs> Hey, look who's joining us in the wine room. Let's see who we got here. Y'all are on time. Y'all are actually early. You know what? Y'all real nosy. That's why y'all early tonight. <laughs> Let me see who's here. I've got um, Divine underscore 72T has joined. Hey, I got Kim Boxel has joined. Oh, my mom's here. Guys, go follow my mom at imani.richardson.792. Hi, mommy. I have Danity Dana Marie is here. I'm just going to wave at everybody. Happy Wednesday and happy first day of fall and happy new hair. Who this? <laughs> Listen, guys, boy, do I have a doozy of an interview tonight. My lady of the week is Miss Shana Mangatal. She is an author, an actress, a director, and an entertainment industry vet. And like I said, she's an author. She wrote a book called Michael and Me. Yes, the Michael Jackson. That's who she's talking about in her book. So if you guys can stay tuned, I'm going to bring her into the wine room, but you guys know the drill. Let's go on and raise your glass and let's toast it up. Clink, 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 clink. And thank you guys for joining me this evening. Yes. Okay. So this song is really near and dear to me. I auditioned for the creative and performing arts in Philadelphia. Yes. I was a dance major. Y'all can't tell. I'd be killing it, right? No, y'all can't tell. But anyway, yes, I have lived lot nine lives, and like I said, this song is really near and dear to me. So, you guys, give me a couple of minutes, and I'm going to bring my lady of the week, Miss Shauna Mangatal, into the wine room. But I want to say hi to y'all real quick. Let's see who else do we have. Hey, Lanny, be the stylist. Hold up. Wait a minute, because I did not shout her out. Y'all, look at my hair. It's cute, isn't it? Yes, she did the damn thing today. Thank you, my dear. Go follow her at Lanny, L-A-N-I, B is in Bravo, the stylist, okay? I also have to shout out to my makeup artist, Mr. Alex, at M-U-A, Alex with two X. Make sure you guys go follow him as well. All right, let's see who else we got in here. Good Lord, there's a whole bunch of y'all coming in here. Ooh, Coco underscore and underscore Abby has joined. Shop Simply Sue has joined. Gee, Louise, let's see. OMG, I've got a whole bunch of people in here. Let's see, let's see, let's see. I have my underscore devoted underscore heart has joined. Ooh, and my lady of the week has joined as well. All right, Shauna, go ahead and push that button so I can bring you on into the wine room. Hey, every look at all these people. Hey, Crystal underscore 05. Hello, K9 Samuels. I'm just going to wave at everybody until she presses that little button for us. I hope you guys are having a wonderful first day of fall. I am. I'm feeling all fall, y'all. Although it doesn't get that cold here in Los Angeles, but you know, we have to do what we do. All right, let me bring her on in. There you go. Donna, go ahead and press that button and I'm bringing you into the wine room. Oh, hey, Phyllis. PCPR underscore communicate. Oh, hello, beautiful. Hey. How are you? <laughs> let me Good, how are you this doing? Real quick. Hi, Shauna. Hey, Tanya. How are you? Good, how are you? Oh, well, you look gorgeous as always. I have your shirt on. Oh, hey, <laughs> lady. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Shauna. Thank you so much for joining me here this evening sure. in the wine room. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, but before we get started, we must raise our glasses. Do you have your wine glass? I do. Wonderful. We're going to cling, cling, cling. Take a little sip. <laughs> a big sip. <laughs> mm. Yes, a big sip. And everybody out there in the audience, make sure you have your glass of wine so you can take a big sip as well. <laughs> All right, my dear. So before we get started, 
go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell everyone who you are and where you're from. I am Shauna Mongatal. I'm originally from Washington, D.C., but I, I've lived in Los Angeles for since 1989. So like 31, no, what? 32, 31 years. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so Shauna and I know each other from our time at the Comedy Store with Guy Tory. Shout out to Guy. Hey, Guy. Um, he used to do a room called Fat Tuesdays, and Shauna and I worked there. And yep. so that was over uh, 20 some odd years ago, but uh, you know, we, won't, <laughs> we, won't, we won't mention any numbers and stuff. But yeah, so that's how you and I became acquainted. And Shauna, I want to say this to you. If ever there's a time that I need someone to hold a secret, <laughs> you, my dear, are going to be my secret keeper. Because, oh. girl, I had no idea until I read your book. Shauna, I'm like, what? When? <laughs> how? So, I yes, my dear, you do know how to keep a secret. I probably never even mentioned Michael Jackson when we knew each other. And no, I never, we never, met. never. <laughs> yeah, I never mentioned. You, you had no idea, right? No, I had no idea. But here's what I did know, is that you knew everyone. <laughs> everyone that walked into the comedy store, Eddie Murphy, I mean, you name it, you yeah. knew everyone. Okay, so before I get there, so I just want to take the viewers on a walk down memory lane. So it's 1988, and your aunt takes you and your friend to, is it the Bad concert? Was it Bad? Yeah. Bad. Okay. So at Madison Square Garden. At Madison Square Garden, right? So like many of us teenagers, you know, we're fans of Michael Jackson. So tell me what was it like your first experience seeing him live um, perform? It was like the best moment of my life up to that point. <laughs> you know, I, right, I was right. 17 then. And my goodness, it was just magical to see um, Michael just right in front of my face. It, back then, or I should say Erica, he played small arenas, maybe mm -hmm. 17,000 seaters. In Europe, it's huge stadiums. So for us, we got to see him up close and, you know, in person. So when you went to a Michael Jackson concert in America, it was um, like he was in your living room. And mm -hmm. I made my way up to the front row. And yes. Literally was like he was in my living room. And it was just, um, it was it was magical. I mean, to be a teenager in the height of Michael Mania in the 80s, and I was in New York City at Madison Square Garden, Hi. and it was just the most exciting night of my life. It, I mean, and I saw him. I mean, I saw the bad concert after that. After that amazing experience, I saw it like maybe 10 more times. Wow. See, I'm from DC, so I saw it in New York first, then came to the DC area. I went to like a bunch of shows there. Then I went to the LA shows because by, by that time, I think I moved to LA. So <laughs> it was a really long tour. So right. it was a great um, time to be a teenager, you know, in the eighties. And um, Michael was just on top of the world. Okay, so you mentioned you moved to LA. So you and your best friend, you load up your car, you move to LA in hopes of becoming a singer. I think that's what you said in your book, right? Yeah. And okay, but that didn't pan out, but you ended up landing, I guess what could be considered a dream job for a person, you know, newly to LA. You're working at the Sandy Galen and Jim Mori agency, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And this agency is probably the biggest, if not the biggest agency in LA at the time. And they represent like everyone. So tell, tell the audience some of the people that they represented. Oh gosh, we had, um... Martin Lawrence, Dolly Parton, Neil Diamond, Renee Zellweger, Nicole Kidman, Whoopi Goldberg, Paula Abdul, um, the Pointer Sisters, Matt Davis, um, everybody. <laughs> everybody. And the and you man, said Brad Pitt, right? Brad Pitt wasn't managed by, the, by us, but he came into the office. He was nobody. He wasn't, right. Right. Nobody, but he was friends with one of the managers there, and she brought him into mm. the office introduced him to everybody and he came up to my desk and said hi I'm Brad and I was like oh hi right. and you know right. I heard of Brad Pitt in my life and right. all that he was gorgeous and right. he had blue eyes I think and I was eating Taco Bell that day <laughs> <laughs> because 
you know, when you're at a, the front desk, you want to kind of put on a good front. So when guests would come in, I would like hide my food and stuff and pretend like I wasn't eating. Um, but then like Brad caught me because he like came up from behind or the side and I was like, go <laughs> you know, just um, golfing down this um, Taco Bell taco. And he right. came when I was doing it and, and I was like very embarrassed, but quickly I realized that Brad is a pretty nice guy because he was like, oh my God, Taco Bell. <laughs> That's my favorite <laughs> <friend> ever. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Beverly every single day. I love it. Yeah, dude. Love Taco Bell. So I've loved Brad Pitt ever since that moment. I was like, right. oh, cool guy. And then about, I'd say a week or two later, um, Thelma and Louise came out. And that's when he just became a superstar. And I was like, oh, that's Brad Pitt. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and then like Elizabeth Taylor, she was one of uh, my boss, Sam Gallen's best friends. So oh, wow. All day, every day. Uh, and of course, you know, she good friends with Michael as well. So it was like a whole little network of um, these high powered legends, basically, um, who just called all day, every day and who came in all the time. It was like, it was literally a dream come true. And it was a dream job. I, I really don't think I'll ever have a job that <laughs> great. Right, right, right. right. So I, I like to say you were with the millennials called the plug. You right. know, <laughs> so, right? right? Yeah, I was like 21 when I started there. Right. So it was, um, I was pretty naive as to people who wanted to befriend me to get the plug, you know? I was right, like, right. Oh, <laughs> Why right. does that be my friend? This is cool. Because, right. you know, growing up, I really didn't have a lot of friends. I'm really shy. I still am actually shy, mm -hmm. introverted. Um, so I wasn't really used to people like wanting to be my friend. <laughs> so right, right. You're working with someone like Michael Jackson, suddenly everyone comes out of the woodworks. And it was it was actually difficult because a lot of people who I thought were my friends at that time, I learned they really weren't. They were just right. my friends to try to get next to Michael. So right. it, that was difficult. Okay, so let's talk about this. So I, I just imagine you because the one thing that I did love was hearing your voice oh, as you're you. telling the story. You know, so guys, if you don't have her book, it's Michael and me. Download the audiobook so you can hear it from her her actual voice. So you talk about a time where Michael calls in, like I'm like I'm Michael, like I know him, you know, we're on a first name basis, but you know. <laughs> so Michael Jackson calls in. And by this time, you guys had kind of developed a rapport, you know, him calling in, you filled in the calls and all of that. And so this particular time he calls in. And he's like wanting you to take down the lyrics to a song that he's working on, yeah. right? And yeah. you said the lyrics are a little racy, mm -hmm. right? And so do you remember what the song was or? <laughs> I still have it right here. It was like, I think it was like two pages long. It was a long song. So we were on the phone for like almost an hour. I, I doing Wow. This he called me, we were, um, I had gotten cast, although I think this was before I got cast in this short film, but it was a short film called Is This Scary? And it was right. supposed to be the theme song for Adam's Family. Adam's Family, right? Mm -hmm. It was a sequel to Adam's Family. And um, the kids were gonna be in, or they were in it actually, Christina Ricci and all the kids from Adam's Family, they were in this short film. Stephen King wrote it and all of this. Um, so prior, so they needed that song. So th that was the song that he, it to me it was called family thing <laughs> and mm. like, like you know an innocent enough title he called me and just out of the blue we weren't really close or friends or anything he just out of but we had you know been like talking and he was right talking, right and um so then he called me one day and uh, asked if he could dictate this new song that he had written for this new short film. So I was like, okay. I said, and I remember I said, are you sure you want me to do it, Michael? Because I was just the receptionist. I didn't right. type, I didn't take dictation, none of that. All I did was answer the phone. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know, I, I'd really like for you to do this. So I said, okay. So all the phone calls that were coming in, I had to ignore them, you know, and because Michael was on the phone. Absolutely. And, um, so he started reading these lyrics to me and I quickly realized they were like, they had double entendre. Mm. <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah, very sexy. And you know, right. I was so young and innocent. I was like, I didn't know what was going on. I was like, what, <laughs> what's happening here? Right, right. I don't really know what was happening, but um, 
but yeah, it was, that was like the first moment when I knew that, you know, he liked me the way I liked him. And because he, it, the voice that he would use when he did those kind of things, it was like a different kind of like flirty type of voice. Oh. And another thing that really st stuck out um, to me was that he was chewing gum, just like really fast and like, you know, <laughs> like he was excited, but right. gum that was, that I could hear the most, I guess it was gum, but um, that really stood out to me. And and he would like take long pauses in between every line. I remember he would read me a line and then I would read it back to him and then he wouldn't say anything. And then I'd say- He needed it to settle there. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I'm ready. And then he, like, he'd say, okay, <laughs> the next line. It, it, was, it was an interesting experience, but then I, you know, I realized that that was how Michael was. You just never knew what to expect day to day from him. And that's what made the job so exciting. And that's what made him so intriguing. And one of the reasons why I just like had a huge crush on him at that point. Right. Okay, so fast forward a little bit, you know, you have the phone calls, you know, then it kind of starts to, you know, lead to, you know, somewhere else where you guys become, you know, closer, right? Yeah. And I know you said that, you know, during this time you were, inexperienced romantically you know yes. you kind of didn't you I don't even think you said you had like your first kiss yet no. right well, and then you said you guys shared many firsts yeah so I'll leave that with you guys in the audience with those first could be but <laughs> you can read it in a book so was he romantic was he macho was he direct like what what kind of guy was he intimately you know, he actually was direct. Um, oh. it, <laughs> <laughs> when people say that Michael was shy, I understand why they say that because there are moments when he was shy, but that wasn't his true nature. His true nature mm. was not shy at all. He, um, when he spoke to me, he looked me directly in the eyes and it was, it could almost be intimidating because I, I was really shy. I was more shy than Michael by far. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you know, he just looks you right in the eyes and it, it kind of pierces your soul almost. And it would make me like kind of, uh, you know, uncomfortable because I'm like, oh my God, you know, he's just like looking straight through me. But um, yeah, he wasn't, he was very direct. I think that's something that people don't know about his personality. He mm -hmm. would, if he wanted to know something, he would just ask you straight out. Mm -hmm. No beating around the bush, you know, just um, straight to it. He's a Virgo too. So, you know, mm -hmm. they have certain, type of person, very dynamic personality. And perfectionist was, too. Yes, it, most Virgos I know are perfectionists. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, um, so I think that that, uh, people ask me like, what would they be surprised about if they knew, you know, about Michael's personality? And I, I would say it's, it's his directness and his like, he wasn't really shy. He was shy mm. in situations because people were, you know, crowding around him and staring at him and trying to grab at him. But who wouldn't, you know, be a little bit, um, you know, standoffish in those moments. But in, in private moments, he wasn't shy. You know, it's funny, you talk about your shyness, and that is something that I do remember about you when we oh. were together. <laughs> no, seriously, and I, and it's funny because you don't know if it's a person, if you're shy or are you just like, you know what, I just don't bother with these people. But you were always, you were, you were very much an introvert. And although, you know, we worked in a public setting, you literally, you did your job, you came back, you know, and, and that was the extent of that. And, and even making friends in that way, you didn't make friends there. You really showed up to do your job and, and that was that. So that's absolutely yeah, right. yeah it, it made sense to me when I, when I read the book. Okay, so let's skip to your cast, like you said in the video mm -hmm. um, for the Adams Family. Um, and like you said, later they called it Ghost. So what was that like working with him on set? Was he like the consummate professional? Was he like uptight or was he a prankster? Like, what was he like working with? Oh my God. Um, well, is the scary, I guess we can break it up into two separate experiences. Is the scary was the first one in 1993. And that one, I mean, it started off with normal Michael and normal Michael on set is practical joke Michael, you know, laughing. Yes having fun, just one of us. Um, that was my first, you know, experience working with him in 93 on Is This Scary? So I didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I still remember the first day of shooting, I was standing there on set 
and then he walks in with this cape on he like had a cape on and a hood <laughs> and um and then he spotted me and he was like oh hi <laughs> i was like oh wow you know what a great welcome you know from michael and then he came and stood next to me and he was asking me what he was supposed to do because he hadn't mm. been there for the rehearsals and i had and i remember like right before the director called um action he whispered in my ear and said um when am I supposed to turn around? <laughs> right, right. Because I knew like when he was supposed to turn around, when he was supposed to say his lines. Um, and he was asking me when he was supposed to do that. So I was thinking, oh, God, I hope I, I tell him the right thing, you know, but I, I whispered back to him. And then after that, like all the other extras and actors were asking me, like, how do you know Michael? Why is he talking to you? Because he really wasn't talking to anybody but me. Right. Um, so they were like really wondering. And then after a while, they asked if we were related because it, I didn't tell anyone that I worked for his manager either until they right. started asking. But you know me, I've always been just very private and right. I didn't say anything until I had to. But, um, but yeah, he's just like so down to earth, so funny. Um, just, I, I, I can't stress it enough, just a human being, regular guy. And I yeah. think a lot of people can't get that through their head. He was just yeah. a regular guy <laughs> in person on stage of course he was Michael Jackson the king of pop and when the camera started rolling and when the lights started um you know when they the lights are bright and the the fog machine started right oh, lights camera action right he instantly became the king of pop Michael Jackson right. when just like a few minutes ago he was standing next to me laughing and giggling about some something stupid that had nothing to do <laughs> with what we were filming so right. there were two michaels and um and i think that's another thing that made him really intriguing because not only was his was he this cool sweet nice regular guy but he was also superstar king of pop michael jackson and you just couldn't help but um be sort of drawn into him and his world when you were able to witness that in person because it was something that you just don't see every day. Yeah. I think you and I were having a conversation about this is that because we live here in LA, we see celebrities every day. It's the norm for us. Yep. You know, and I think to your point, especially someone like Michael Jackson, who's this larger than life figure, people just want to put him in that box. And they don't want to accept the fact that first he's human, a man, yeah. You know what I mean? Before he was all of those things. So yeah, I just think people just see him as this like out of world, you know, personality that they can't even imagine that, you know, he could be just a regular guy who liked eating maybe fried chicken or whatever it was that, you know, <laughs> you said he liked. So, okay. So I want to switch gears a little. So we all know that I think it was in 1993, and in 2003, that's when um, the rumors came out about his indiscretions. Um, and so during this time, you guys are friends. You guys are intimate friends. You've been in his life for a long time. Um, was there ever a point that you believed the rumors? Were you emphatic, emphatic that they could not be true? And did you have conversations with him about them? Um, in 93, when the first allegations came out, I was actually with him um, on the set. We were filming Is This Scary? And that's why we didn't finish the film because the allegation, the Jordan Chandler allegations broke like right in the middle of filming that short film. Um, and I saw him change. Like at first he was this happy-go-lucky, you know, fun, uh, funny guy. And then maybe about, I'd say three days into it, his eyes were just dead and just mm -hmm. sad and depressed. And I was like, I wonder what's wrong with Michael. And then all of a sudden he just stopped showing up to the set. And that wasn't like Michael because he was a perfectionist and he was very excited about this short film, Is It Scary? There was a lot of money invested in it. There was a lot riding on this short film. And for him mm -hmm. not to show up, I knew there was something going on. Um, and we were kind of left in the dark for, a a couple of weeks, um, but we tried to finish the short film without him, which was hard because he was a star and he was like in every scene, <laughs> but right. we did what we could. And actually what we did is on YouTube, you can go find it, Is This Scary? And it's all the scenes that we actually did. Yeah, shoot. I've seen it. I see you in there, see you doing <laughs> your thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, so after it broke, um, it, he left to go on the uh, Dangerous Tour, like right after that happened. 
and eventually he called and I told him, you know, I'm here for you, Michael. Um, I miss you. Uh, I can't wait for you to get back home. Because this is when he had like gone into hiding. Um, mm. He wasn't really calling anyone. No one knew where he was. This was after the tour kind of like got canceled because he couldn't go on. He was doing very badly. And I was so worried. Um, and but that's when I knew I had to say something. And I finally said, you know, I love you. <laughs> and I never said that to any man in my life. So there was wow. Like, <laughs> hold up, hold up, hold up, Sean. Hold up, hold up. We, we can't skip over this. So you guys are on the phone. You got to set up the situation for me. So you're on the phone. You're talking to him about, you know, him being gone. He's doing this tour. And you just blurt this out. I, I didn't know what to <laughs> be honest because all the I mean you don't know it was I mean you do know because you're old enough to have been there during that time but yes terrible like he was being called all kinds of names and prior to that he was like you know Mr. Innocent could do no wrong everyone loved him and you would right. expect that the next day you know suddenly he would just become like a monster in, in the public's eyes and it was very difficult for me to um, deal with because um, I loved him, you know, before he tell him, of course, I loved him. And I had grown to know him on that set, like right before this happened. And I was like, this, that's not the Michael that I know. He's not what, what the press is calling him. He, it's right. not, that's not him. Um, it didn't even seem like the, the same person that they were talking about. And I just felt so sorry for him and bad for him. And I didn't know what to say. Um, but I've been asking his managers like, well, how's Michael doing? And they would tell me he wasn't doing well. And there were some nights when they didn't know if he would even make it through the night. Um, so I was thinking, okay, when he calls, I, I have to say something just so that he knows that I'm still in his corner. So he called and he sounded so depressed. <laughs> he was, uh, and he was slurring his words, which concerned me. And um, right. I, I knew I had to say something. And so, I told, I said, I love you. And he immediately, well, not immediately, it was maybe like a five second delay. <laughs> and I was worried. I was like, oh, God. right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. My biggest client, I love him. But, and then he, he said, I love you too. That's so, oh, my, he was so happy <laughs> that I said that. And right. I said, can't wait for you to get home. And I miss you. And, um, and I said, and I'm, and I'm always here for you. And he said, thank you so much. That is so, he was so relieved. And then he switched um, topics and went into the film, the, uh, you know, the short film that we had just filmed, Is This Scary? He remembered a scene that we had done mm -hmm. and like was saying the lines that he had said in the film and that the other actor in the film had said. And it was a uh -huh. scene um, where, the mayor, he, he played the mayor himself in Ghost, but in this 93 version, it was an actual actor. And the mayor of the town and his little son were uh, there with us, the townspeople, to kick Michael out of town because we wow. said he was a weirdo and he was scaring our children. <laughs> and this uh, scene that Michael had recounted was the one where um, the mayor was saying, you know, you're scaring our children. And Michael um, bent down and asked the little boy, do I scare you? And the little boy shook his head, no. And then the mayor said, yes, yes, you do scare him. You're scaring our children. And that's the scene that Michael remembered, mm -hmm. said to me over the phone. And so I figured that that was like Michael's way of telling me that's what's happening in this case as well. Yeah, it's, a, it's almost like it was a foreshadowing of you know, what was to come, you know, when they say art imitating life, that video was, you know, after you, after they did that, that's when, you know, everything started coming out. So that's, that's really eerie. Really eerie. But yeah, none of that had happened. And we were doing this video and it foretold that was going to happen. Right, and right. So like freaked out by that. Like at the time, I don't think I even realized it. But um, now that I look back, I'm like, wow. You know, all that, we acted it out before it happened. We were calling him weirdo. And, you know, get out of town. You're scaring our children and a freak and all these things. I, Michael was standing right in front of me. And I had to yell those names at him. And wow. then, you know, like a couple of weeks later, the whole world was calling him those names. And it, it, was a, it was a surreal experience, especially someone who was young like me. I was like, I don't know, 23 when we did that um, film. And it was, uh, it was traumatic too, for it to go right. from 
because before before that happened, I really thought that you know we had a chance because things right. were like kind of like growing naturally, and you know it, it was just wonderful. Um, so and everyone who worked with in the office, they they would call him my husband. Or my Your husband, husband, right? No, I, when I when I listened to you say that, I was like, wow, like okay, so everybody could see the the chemistry that you guys had, you know, yes. the friendship that you had had developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, so let me ask you this, Shauna. Um, so you talk about the closeness that you guys had, you know, knowing him intimately as well. Um, why do you think that he would then go on to marry Lisa Marie Presley and then have children with Debbie Rowe instead of you, especially okay. given <laughs> the fact that everyone in your camp was, you know, they were trying to put you guys together. What, what do you, why do you think this happened? I don't know. Um, that was, that was another devastating moment because his managers had actually, and I'd forgotten all about this, to be honest, um, I found the memo, recently, well, like a year or so ago from the National Enquirer. His managers had had a meeting with the National Enquirer and they were like pushing me to be his public girlfriend. It was gonna mm -hmm. um, and so I was really excited, you know, I thought this is it. Um, but they just had to convince Michael to go along with it. But it was in the works. And when this happened, it was still going to be, they, they, I remember they told me to get my passport ready because they were gonna fly me over to be with Michael in wherever he was in hiding. Um, so it was not only gonna be like a private thing, but it was gonna be like a public thing. And you know, for someone like me who had never been around this before, it was so exciting. It was like one of the most exciting times of my life. Um, it was a, an emotional roller coaster because it was exciting, but at the same time, I was sad because I didn't know what was going to happen to Michael. Um, so that's what I was expecting to happen. And then I see on the news one day that he got married to Lisa Marie. And I was like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? Right. Yeah. Right. I wasn't that surprised because I knew they had been seeing each other. A lot of people didn't even know that they knew each other. But, you know, I knew that they had at least developed a friendship. And I think she wanted a record deal with MJJ Records or something. And that's what they had been talking about prior to that. Um, but then I see on the news he got married. And it was, it, was a, it was stunning. It was shocking. I didn't know what to say or do. I was thinking, gosh, when my calls. What am I going to say to him? Am I going to mention it or not? And um, I did mention it. I congratulated him. And we actually had a conversation. And, and he told me not to believe anything that I saw on the news. He said, it's all publicity. Don't mm. believe everything you see. It's just publicity. So I'm their marriage was a publicity stunt then? Well, that's what he told me. You know, mm. my eyes are. I don't know if it was true. You know, right. Because what else could he say? But it worked because it made me feel better. I was like, oh, okay, then I don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> you know, it's all publicity, no big deal. But, you know, but I had heard from her camp that it was real. You know, she mm -hmm. really uh, was in love with him and believed that it was real. So who knows? I, I still today don't know if he was telling me the truth or I think it's somewhere in between, you know, maybe on in his mind, um, not only was it publicity, but he also, he liked her and she definitely loved him. She used to call in the office a lot. So I, I talked to her a few times, um, but yeah. Well, I just remember that awkward kiss that they shared. And there was just, for me, there was just like no passion. There just was no chemistry, but I mean, who am I? I'm just <laughs> on the outside looking in. <laughs> but anyway, so I know that in your book, you kept saying that he kept telling you that you guys needed to keep this a secret. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you feel like he wanted to keep you a secret? Well, obviously, you know, he had other things going on in his life that I didn't know about. Um, mm. But also, once the public finds out about something, it just becomes crazy. If they had found out anything about me, my whole life would have changed. Um, and I don't know if it, I mean, in my mind, I was thinking, how could that be bad? This would be great. <laughs> you know? Right all the world but he knew better because I was shy I was wasn't a public figure at the time um I was just a receptionist at his manager's office so if the public found out about anything like that you know the press would have been all over me and whereas I was the one um who was fielding the press I was the one that they were calling to try to get through to his managers mm -hmm. so I had to really we both had to keep it like business you know 
it had to be like separate business and private. So what we spoke about in private, he would always tell me not to even tell his managers that, you know, we had spoken or what we had spoken about. Mm -hmm. It was between us. And I remember him saying, you know, this is just between us. Okay. <laughs> you promise. I said, okay, I promise, Michael. So it was kind of like, I don't know, when you're in school and you make like a pinky square. <laughs> right, right, right. That like after every conversation, no matter what it was. So I just kind of got used to used to that. And, and when you're in that world, in, in the Michael Jackson world, it's like a bubble. You, you sort of forget what real life is like. That had become my world and my life, and it became normal for me. So I, when I look back on it now, I, was, I think, like, wow, I was really living an amazing surreal life. And you don't realize it when you're in it. I, yeah. I see it now as like just unbelievable. It doesn't even feel like me, you know, anymore. It seems like it was another another person, but um, but yeah, it was um, it was a whirlwind, and it was it was a time that I know I'll never experience again. But Michael was he was a very he was a private person, and um, but and and I know people are like, well, why did you write a book? Yeah, because I was going to ask you that. Because listen, one thing I will say about reading your book or listening to the audio book. I was so impressed with the copious notes that you took in your diary. Girl, you had, I mean, what you call his perfume was Bella Versailles. You had dates. You had uh, outfits that he may have had on. All the people that you were able to name and the events that you were able to recall. So in my head, I'm thinking, well, if she made all this up, she is really good. <laughs> that has to be really good. Right? Yeah, I mean, no, you have to be damn good um, yeah. for the details in the book. So when you're keeping this diary, Shauna, are you keeping it in hopes to one day write a book or was it simply cathartic for you? Was it just, or both? Were you just like, you know what? I need to release this. I need to put it on paper and get it out there. What, what was the impetus behind you writing the book? I really just wanted to remember all these amazing moments that were happening to me. I started writing in my diary. In a, I started a diary journal when I was about 12. And so I have things dating back to like 1982. <laughs> you know, wow. that I I was writing things, everything that happened to me from the time I was 12 until, you know, then. Um, so that was just what I did. I was a very, uh, um, I loved writing. Mm. But I didn't know that writing would ever turn into a book. I just loved writing my feelings, my emotions. And that's how I kind of would, um, in my mind, um, figure out what to do next writing it down kind of, I don't know, it kind of helps you mm -hmm. um, work through your own emotions because sometimes you don't know what you're feeling. You just know that you're giddy or maybe you're depressed and sad. Writing it down and then reading it the next day. I always loved like the next day when I could go back and read what I had written because then you have, you have a different perspective. You're kind of more on the outside. You're looking back on what you were thinking that day. And sometimes you're not thinking the same thing the next day. <laughs> But thank God I, I wrote all that stuff down um, because I would not have a book if I hadn't written it because my memory is not that great, to be right, honest. Right, <laughs> when, right. Because when I turned back to read my um, journals, I was like, that happened? And this happened? I was surprised myself because I didn't remember a lot of it. And if you think about it, you don't remember a lot of what happened in your life unless you took a picture or you wrote it down or you yeah. took a picture. So, because back then we didn't have cell phones. So no, there was no selfies. There were no cell phones. There, shoot, we were just coming into the internet and all of that. So, you know, this is prior to all of that. So, okay. So they say hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, would you do different? Would you have allowed yourself to kind of stay on this roller coaster with him? Because he, he would come in your life and then he would disappear and go on and do other things and then come back to you. What? would you say to your 20 something year old self now? I'm sure I would have done it mm. the way I was just more, been more smart about it. Um, mm. I've been as shy. Like if it were now, things would be much different. <laughs> Back right. then, kind of let things slide and I would be afraid to like bring up things to him or to, you know, start certain conversations with him. I let him lead every conversation we ever had because mm -hmm. um, he was a talker you know he was good at talking and he loved talking he loved being on the phone he loved um asking questions and finding out about me and or just people in general he was 
he was a very inquisitive, um, per very smart guy. Um, so what I would have done different is um, just been less shy. Sometimes I feel like I just should have been like, I don't know. More uh, assertive with yeah, your more, voice. That's a great, mm -hmm. thank you, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'm a lot more assertive now that I'm older, but back then I had no assertiveness in me. I would just right, let right. pass me by or come to me, and if and um, that was it. And I do look back and I regret, you know, certain certain things that I didn't do or even that I did do. But you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. We're, we're only young once. Um, That's, right. That's the time to make mistakes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you've recovered well. So, Thank you. <laughs> okay. So what do you say to the skeptics, to the people that say, you know what, she's nothing more than just a super fan. Uh, she didn't really know him like that. And just flat out don't believe you. What's your message to them? Read the book. Because everyone that's read the book, they usually are like, oh my God, you know, at first I didn't believe you, but I read the book and now I see you couldn't make this up. Um, <laughs> Not only that, but as you said, here in LA, we work, well, I work in the entertainment industry. We all have worked around entertainers. They're just regular people. And right. when you look here, it's not such a amazing or shocking thing that maybe you're friends with Michael Jackson or Elizabeth Taylor or whoever, you know, amazing it is, Beyonce, you know? Yeah, it's, we rub elbows every day, yeah. They're just people. And what um, fans don't realize is that they don't know what's going on in the, their, um, you know, so favorite celebrities' lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, All they the camera shut off. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. All they know is what they see, uh, is what the celebrity wants to show them, basically. It's just like Instagram. We only right. post pictures that we want people to see. They don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. The other cute ones. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the right. same with celebrities, um, only it's even more controlled there, there. And back then, they didn't have the internet, so it was very controlled what got right. out. Um, so yeah, you don't really know a celebrity until you actually know them. And I was surprised, I, you know, I, um, getting to know Michael, I was like, wow, you know, this is just a person. This is just a guy. <laughs> it, right. Sometimes it would just dawn on me, this is just a regular guy. And I think um, I would hope that uh, fans would at least read the book first and then form an opinion instead of so nasty and mean just right off the bat without yes. giving a chance. Right. Well, wonderful. Okay, well, I just have a few questions left. And then we're going to open it up to the audience, maybe, and see if they have a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> so what have you been up to? You, you, Like I said, you know everybody. You've done yeah. some of everything can you tell the audience some of the things that you've been up to and what you're currently working on oh yeah i well currently i've been working with howard hewitt he's the lead singer of the group shalimar um and i was a big fan of shalimar growing up too so this is also like a dream come true to be able to work with someone that i've admired all of my life um i directed my first music video um it was his christmas video it came out in december it's called that's christmas check it out on um, youtube so i directed the whole thing edited it and filmed it all on my iphone so oh, my. damn <laughs> <laughs> like that. check it out okay yeah think up, you know, his vocals and all that. Um, and we just finished a second video. So it might be my second uh, direct directing um, assignment job um, for a new song that he has coming out next week, actually. The video and the song are premiering next week and it's called To Thee I Pray. Um, and it's another one that I uh, did on my iPhone. I edited it and uh, it's gonna be really powerful and cool. So look out for that next week. So I, I've been getting into a lot of like behind the scenes stuff and with Howard, I'm kind of like, you know, not only um, assisting his everyday life, but helping to manage his career as well. So I'm, you know, back into that music management stuff. And I love nice. it. Nice. All right, guys, you guys can head over to my website at Hey Lady by Tanya, and that's with an I, and you can read Shauna's impressive bio. The girl <laughs> has done a little bit of everything. And like I said, she knows everybody. Okay, so my last two questions. Um, in your book, each chapter, you start off with a quote. And so I have to ask you, what is your favorite quote? If not from the book, just personally, what's your favorite quote? I would say it's the quote that my mother always instilled in me growing up, and that's, go be your dream. And mm. my life, 
her voice is always ringing in my head, go be your dream. And that's what I did. Um, and I think if it were not for those words from her, I may not have had, you know, the ambition to move out to LA without knowing anyone and just going after um, my dreams. Go be your dream. And I, I say that to everyone. If you have a dream, go for it. We only live once. Um, you just have to figure out how you're going to get to that goal. Because there is a way, you know, there's a certain way. You can't be, um, you have to be focused and you can't uh, veer from that goal or that dream. Just keep going until you get it and you will get it. You just have to persevere and, um, and never give up. It, it works. It really does. So yeah, go be your dream is my favorite quote. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you say that because I always say my mom, who's actually on this live, hi mommy. Um, I always say she didn't give me the spirit of fear. And so when I decided to move to LA, she was like, go. Good for you. you. Know? So if I can't say anything else to parents out there, don't plant that speak of that seed of spear of uh, fear in your kids. Like, let them go for it, you know, right. let them try it because if it doesn't work out, they can always come back home. Right. And you need that support that a lot of people absolutely. Come it's a tough town. If you come out here and you don't have any support and you know, you don't have that background of having a strong either family behind you or you know, a lot of friends who are there to support you, you're gonna get eaten up by this town. You know, Absolutely. there's a lot of ups, but there's a lot of downs and the downs are very down. <laughs> you can do Absolutely. Or very low the next. And it never stops. Like even now, like I have days like that. And, I, and you have to go back, you know, if you believe in God, you have to pray to God or read the Bible or call your mother, your father, whoever. You have to have some sort of support system, else you're just not going to make it. It's that simple. Absolutely. Okay. And so my last question is um, the best advice ever given to you. You talked about your mom telling you to go uh, live your dreams. What's the best advice outside of that ever given to you? I would say um, always um, remain who you are. Don't let others dictate who you should be. So if you come to this town one way, a nice, sweet girl, don't leave this town, you know, like some right. person that you don't even recognize because you have to look yourself in the mirror every day. One right. thing that I kept, you know, held, you know, dear to my heart and I still do are my morals. You know, I was yes. always be um, very cognizant of being someone that was respected, that people respected, that people liked. You know, I was always friendly, never burn a bridge. That's another thing. Don't burn bridges. Mm. You never Especially <laughs> in this town. And it comes back around, like you and me. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't seen you in, you know, a few years, but, yes. you know, and that's because we have that bond from being friends years ago. And yes. uh, so that's the thing. It's like, keep your morals. Don't um, don't be one of the crowd. Be the person that people want to follow, that people want to look up to. You know, that's very important to me. Um, I would love to, you know, mentor young girls. A lot of young girls write me all the time now who are, you know, need advice or who are maybe going through um, troubles or problems. And I'm always there, you know, to help because I know how it is to be a young girl and to be confused. <laughs> but um, I just want to make sure that people keep your morals, you know, be a nice, good girl. If right. a good girl is not out of style, even though you wouldn't know that from the music that's today, um, you know, you don't have to be like everybody else. Be someone that people respect and look up to. It's funny you said that because the tagline of Hey Lady is being a lady never goes out of style. That's so right. I to that. So, so love you message absolutely okay so real quick let me go into the audience here and see if there are any questions let's scroll through can you scroll through and see if there's anything that you would like to address let's see um caleb underscore jenkins underscore 2002 i like what uh he said he said michael jackson always said good news doesn't sell to the media they just seek out negative things and we all know that you know, so nothing, nothing spreads faster than bad news or negativity. So mm -hmm. um, let's see if there's anything else mm -hmm. like respect, what she told you. I mean, just a whole bunch of comments in here. <laughs> so Crazy comments. Maybe I don't want to read them. <laughs> right, right. There's some crazy ones in there. But I think, 
I think I addressed most of what a lot of people wanted to know. And if I didn't, guys, you guys can go pick her book up on Amazon. It is called Michael and Me. And they can also follow you. Shauna, can you give them your Instagram handle? Sure. It's Shauna Mangatal, which is S-H-A-N-A-M-A-N-G-A-T-A-L. Shauna Mangatal. That's it. Um, and um, I'm not on Twitter that much, but I'm on there. I'm Shauna Mangatal. And then Facebook. Um, I just got verified on Facebook. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> so it's Shauna Mangatal with the blue check. So if you see all the right. Um, so yeah, come follow me on Instagram. I'd love to um, see you all there. You're all right, Miss Blue Check. Check. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. OMG, Shauna, thank you so much for taking the time out to sit with me here this evening in the wine room. This was an amazing conversation. Um, I just want to say thank you for your many, many years of friendship. Thank uh, you. Thank you for remaining who you are, a sweet, loving, kind woman, you know, and that's what I remember from 20 some odd years ago. So you are who you are. And also thank you everyone who joined us in the wine room this evening. I am here every Wednesday. I bring a phenomenal woman over the age of 40 into the wine room and we talk about all different types of things. So I hope to see you guys back here next week for another edition of Wine Down Wednesday. But before we go, Shauna, we're not gonna let this wine go to waste. Oh, I'm going to be drinking it. Pick it up, girlfriend. <laughs> Clink, clink. <laughs> Take a sip. <laughs> all right, guys. And I will see you all next Wednesday. Thanks, Shauna. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.